Now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Wesley Gutsch to Conservation Conversations. Perhaps before I do a more formal intro, I'll just share a little person, personal anecdote of how we know each other. So Wesley and I were in fact compatriots at rival schools in Grahamstown, but this is something that we only figured out at a later stage while we were contemporaries at the Fitzpatrick Institute at UCT, which is where we really became friends as Wesley was doing his master's uh, through the Fitzpatrick as was I. I did get some pleasure in spying Wesley at our 10 year school reunion in 2019 after St Andrews did manage to beat Kingswood that year. But um, despite the, the friendly rivalry, we do remain good friends nonetheless. So Wesley Gush is a keen birder and a research ecologist from the Eastern Cape. Although born in Cape Town, he spent most of his formative years on the family farm near Grahamstown after they moved there in 1998. He grew up around the time that his family and other families from the farming community made the decision to convert some of their farmland into what is today the Big Five Game Reserve of Amakala. This undoubtedly helped foster his love for wildlife and the natural world. After studying at Stellenbosch and UCT, finishing with an MSc in Conservation Biology from the Fitzpatrick Institute, focusing on endangered grassland larks, he went on to work as a research ecologist on a private conservancy in Zimbabwe for two years, focusing on large carnivals. In 2019, he moved back to his home province of the Eastern Cape, where he currently works on the family cattle farm while keeping one foot in carnival research through serving on the management committee of a Macaulay Game Reserve. Birding remains Wesley's passion and his primary hobby, however, and he has made it a mission since returning to the Eastern Cape to explore all the corners of the province in search of the spectacular avian diversity it has to offer. So Wesley, I'm going to invite you to turn on your video and unmute yourself. And uh, one of the corners of the province that you have explored extensively is Mountain Zebra National Park. And we are all very much looking forward to hearing your experiences and also sharing some of the um, tips and tricks, as I said, uh, about this wonderful destination in the glorious Eastern Cape. So welcome to Conservation Conversations and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Andrew. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks again, Andrew, for that uh, very kind introduction. It's a real privilege to be part of the BirdLife South Africa Conservation Conversations webinar series. I feel like I've got very big boots to fill considering the, um, the speakers we've had in this series and in fact are still lined up to, to follow after this webinar and some real legends um, and people that I've looked up to in the birding world. Uh, also, I hope I do justice to this topic um, because I know everyone who has visited Mountain Zebra National Park um, has a very special place in their heart for this, um, this park. However, I think that um, tonight's uh, objective is to really encourage those of you who haven't been to the park or perhaps only once or twice um, to consider going back or going for the first time because, uh, as it said in the bio, for this talk, it really is one of the gems of South Africa's national parks. So just to give a bit of background on the location of the park, it's uh, in the interior of Cape, in the, in the Karoo. And in terms of getting there, it's not really close by to anything. Um, your closest bet to, in terms of major South African hubs is, is PE. Um, next closest is actually Johannesburg at about an eight hour drive. Cape Town, you guys clock at eight and a half hours. And fortunately for the Durbanites, it's a, a 10 hour trek. Um, that being said, it really is worth making your way to this park, um, despite its location off the beaten track. The park was proclaimed in 1937. Uh, it was actually initiated as part of a mountain zebra. Um, project and back then they only had 11 Cape Mountain zebras which they started out with in just under 2,000 hectares. Today there are over 350 Cape Mountain zebra in 28,000 hectares. So it's been a fantastic uh, conservation project that's been going on here and um, through national parks, through sand parks should I say, and you can see just from those numbers alone that it really has been a resounding success in terms of the objective that it set out with. Today the park has exciting megafauna including Cape Buffalo, 
black rhino, lion, and cheetah. And where it really comes into its own is also the chance of seeing some of the elusive arid nocturnal species such as aardvolf and batted fox, which I encountered on The park layout, which I've just uh, I've pulled the map off the Sand Parks website there. Um, and you can see it's, it's kind of a series of loops all sprouting out from the main camp, which I put the little tent icon there for you to be able to see nice and clearly. Um, and from there, you've got the option of, of the several loops, which really enhances your experience of exploring the park. But onto the important topic of the day, what is the birding like at Martin Zebra? Well, the official park list, which you can download off the website, stands at 275. Um, however, through the Sabab 2 project, they've actually recorded 279 species in that central pentad. That's uh, 3210-2525 uh, for the um, Sabab 2 enthusiasts. Uh, and through Citizen Science, 347 cards have been completed. Um, listing, as I mentioned, 279 species. I like to see who holds the high score for each pentad. And for this pentad, it's Andrew Nixon back in 2011, who recorded 129 species in that pentad over the course of five days. So uh, if you ever do visit, that's the, that's the target to beat. So to start off with, um, one of the things to keep in mind is as soon as you reach the park gates, the, the birding starts in earnest. In fact, they have a very nice little bird, um, bird bath right there at the entrance. And in dry times, there's a lot of birds that come to that bird bath. So it's great when you're signing in, you're already starting to see things like golden-breasted bunting, um, cinnamon-breasted bunting, acacia pied barbets, and, and a host of other species right at the park gate. And once you enter the park, you then have a route um, down to the central area where the main camp is. And this is already an important area to keep your eyes open. It's mostly valley bottom. Um, you'll see from the photo that the park is, is largely uh, slopes, uh, valley bottoms sided by slopes which lead up onto plateau grassland uh, habitat. And in these valley bottoms, you have these thicketed streamlines, which um, provide good habitat for a number of interesting species, as well as a kind of acacia dominated grassland where it's almost more like a savanna with, with acacia and other tree species dotted around, dotted through this, this grassland habitat. Something you'll be struck by when entering the park is the abundance of small LBJs buzzing around in blocks. And these can feel quite overwhelming to try and identify, especially on the wing. So it's best to watch where they land and try and get a good look at them. So um, I've coined the term flocking LBJs, which we will be dealing with in the first part of this talk. And if you have patience, it's worth looking at where these birds land in the trees, multiple species that may be um, in a given tree which you need to kind of work through to, to make sure you cover all the species that are in your binoculars. The final example of these flocking LBJs is the red-billed quilia. Um, most people will know that they're one of the most abundant species of bird on earth. And there's a good chance of encountering this species in the park. You can see here is a, a great photo showing the variety of plumages that the, the red-billed quilia comes in. So they also can uh, pose a bit of a challenge to identification and it's worth knowing the different forms of the red billed quilia um, when you're driving on your route to the main camp. But perhaps the most common uh, flocking LBJ in the park is the scaly feathered weaver, previously called scaly feathered finch. Uh, whichever side of the naming debate you are on, I think we can all agree that the Afrikaans name of Bart Maniki is perhaps the best, meaning little beard man, uh, which aptly refers to the striking little black and white um, feather arrangement below the bill, looking like a little salt and pepper beard. Uh, in any case, these guys are always a treat to, to watch uh, and a great little bird to catch up with. Um, and I will stake my reputation that you're guaranteed to encounter this flocking LBJ inside Mountain Zebra. 
There's another photo. Um, this one's taken by my friend, Mayor Prach, who I also studied with at UCT. Um, he's got some really excellent photos scattered throughout this presentation. Another smallish LBJ, uh, not as small as the Bart Monarchy, but um, is the red-headed finch, which are reasonably common in the park as well. Um, and here you can see the male and the female. This photo was taken by Lynette Radman. She's also got some great photos in this presentation, being a, a, one of perhaps the, the, one of the foremost um, birders in the province. So thank you to Lynette for her photos today. And what I love about the red-headed finch is this kind of scalloping on their breast, um, almost reminiscent of the twin spot. Um, and these guys don't quite get the, the acclaim of the various twin spot species in Southern Africa, but I think they've really got striking plumage. Um, and so they're always great to, to add to your list in mountain zebra and a good arid, um, arid loving bird to, to tick here as well. Here's a close up of the male showing that plumage that I was talking about. And then um, in a subsection of the flocking LBJs um, or the flocking LYJs, the little yellow jobs, um, and by this I mean the canaries, a whopping seven canary species have been recorded in the park, um, but cape, yellow fronted and brimstone canaries have um, a reporting rate in the suburb to uh, statistics of less than 4%. So I think we're going to just not worry about those ones too much. Um, on the left is the yellow canary, which is a very nice Karoo canary to catch up with, um, super striking yellow coloration. And they come in at a 20% reporting rate for that central penta that I referred to earlier. Um, and so you have a good chance of bumping into these guys. I have included a picture of the brimstone canary on the right because these two species are quite similar. However, you can see the yellow canary really is that bright yellow color. Um, while the brimstone is a more greeny yellow. And then on the forehead, the yellow canary, his yellow eyebrow uh, is continuous above the bill, whereas the brimstone canary has a break, a sort of greeny yellow um, patch between his two eyebrows. Um, so those are two distinguishing features to look out for. Um, since both of these canaries at first glance are large yellow canaries with these heavy, um, heavy bills. Uh, speaking of separation anxiety <laughs> or the anxiety around separating little yellow jobs, these three species all have yellow rumps and all display kind of gray white plumage. So on the left, we have the female of the yellow canary um, who has quite a streaky breast. So that's a good ID feature to keep in mind. And the middle picture, we have white-throated canary, uh, which is a good bird to connect with in the park as well. Um, yellow canary and white-throated canary both have that heavy bill. So that's not necessarily a good feature to distinguish them on. And they both have the yellow rump. So that breast, um, the breast markings of the yellow canary are a good, a good way to tell. And also the yellow canary is, the females are likely to be hanging out of those bright yellow males, whereas the white-throated canary are both um, that duller gray and white plumage of the central photo there. On the right, we have the black-throated canary, again, a yellow-rumped canary, um, but these guys have that black throat. It's not super visible in this photo, um, but they've also got a much finer beak. So if you do come across uh, a flock of these guys and you, you get a chance to look at their beak, you'll notice that the black-throated canary has that much finer beak um, is also a bit more of a speckled uh, or well-marked back and a little bit of streaking on the breast as well. But that um, the combination of that fine beak and the black throat as well as the yellow rump are good pointers for this species. And then uh, the last of the, the flockers we'll cover today is a real staple of the park. This is the white-browed sparrow weaver. They're perhaps a little bit uh, big and boldly marked to be called LBJs. Um, and in fact, they're very conspicuous in the valley bottoms of the park. They chatter almost incessantly. Um, they construct these uh, sort of collections of very messy nests in the acacia tree. So you really, you can't miss these guys um, through their vocalization as well as um, very prominent nests, um, which are clustered together. Thank <laughs> you. 
So staying in the valley bottoms and this sort of acacia savanna habitat um, or acacia grassland habitat, we'll move on to birds that are more commonly found on their own or perhaps in pairs. And the acacia pied barbet is one of these. At first glance, uh, you might be reminded of the red-fronted tinkerbird, which you may be more familiar with. However, this species is overall a much chunkier, larger bird um, with a heavy, typical barbet beak, um, which you can see here. And then you often detect these guys from the nasal call that they have, a very sort of wah, wah, wah call that they, they give, um, which you'll hear um, almost throughout Mountain Zebra National Park. And then um, moving on to a real crowd pleaser. This is the Rufus Eared Warbler. Um, and I've got a photo uh, there from Mayer again, and one from Craig Widows, uh, top left, um, as well as my own, one of my own pictures. And these guys are really such a great little warbler to connect with. Um, perhaps one of the more frequently encountered warblers, certainly in, in Karoo landscapes. And they're just such a classy looking little bird. So they've got that rust colored cheek contrasting with the white throat and that uh, beautiful little black collar as well. And a nice long tail too. So they, they're really great to, to encounter and very photogenic if you can get them pausing out in the open for a second or two. Another target bird for a lot of people in this park is the common scimitar bill. And we've got some great photos from Lynette here on the left showing that iridescent sheen on the of the common scimitar bill. And these guys uh, are reminiscent actually of the green wood hoopoe, but you can see that that bill is, is much finer and more curved. Um, and is obviously black, although the, the bill of the immature um, green wood hoopoes are also dark. So bill color is not necessarily the distinguishing feature but rather the shape. I was thinking about it earlier. It's a very sun bill, sunbird uh, shaped bill, um, but obviously on this larger, longer tailed bird. And they've got these beautiful white markings underneath the tail as well, which you will see in flight. Um, and my only record of, of scimitar bill in, in the Eastern Cape is actually from Mountain Zebra. So very pleased to connect with the species there a few years ago. Uh, speaking of target birds, uh, I think Andrew mentioned earlier that someone commented that fairy flycatcher was one of their uh, one of their real highlights in the park, and uh, it really is for anyone who manages to connect with the species. Um, they're just such uh, beautiful looking little birds. Um, this photo is also by Craig Widows, and you can just see the markings. They've got this, this almost the Zorro mask. Um, bordered by by white streaks on the face and very pretty little um uh, pretty little white wing bar contrasting against the gray body and these guys are very difficult to to photograph um i will warn you that i'm quite envious of craig's photo where he managed to capture this guy um out in the open So sticking with gray birds but moving on to the larger raptor category uh we come to the goshawks so this is still in the sort of valley bottom, excuse me, especially on the route to the main camp from the main gate. There are two species of goshawk regularly encountered in Mountain Zebra National Park, the Gabar goshawk and the pale chanting goshawk. Um, to me, they look superficially similar. Uh, I know some people will be able to separate them at a glance, but I took a little while before I was comfortable separating these two. And they're not even actually in the same genus, uh, Gabar goshawk being in the Micronasus genus, pale chanting goshawk being the Meliorax genus. And the pale chanting goshawk really is a much larger bird. That's uh, the bird on the right. Sorry, I see I haven't labeled these photos, but um, PCG, as I abbreviated, is on the right. You've got a very upright stance um, and often seen perched on top of uh, acacia trees or other. Um, tree species, a very proud, prominent um, species of goshawk. So um, that's a good feature to look out for. The bird on the left is the Gabar goshawk, and it's a smaller, more secretive goshawk, um, although also encountered in, in the park. Shorter legged, 
Um, and also the, the barring is, is quite good to look at. So if you look at the Gabar Gossok, it's got a slightly um, fuzzier barring um, compared to the Pale Chanting Gossok, which has this more neatly um, and narrow uh, barring below, uh, sort of on the lower belly. But where the, uh, the Gabar Gossok beats the, P, the, the PCG out is that there is a very cool melanistic version of the species, um, the black form of the, sorry, the, yeah, the melanistic form of the Gabar Gossok. And according to research, this makes up uh, anywhere from 7 to 25% of the Gabar Gossok populations in Southern Africa. Um, this is a photo by a friend of mine, Michael Duplessis, who uh, captured this uh, melanistic Gabar Gossok inside the main camp of Mountain Zebra National Park. And in fact, several people I've spoken to uh, have encountered the melanistic form in the park. So it's a really cool bird to, to keep an eye out for. Just a very striking looking uh, raptor. I had to include a photo that I took of this species. This is actually up in Zimbabwe where I worked for a couple of years, as Andrew mentioned. Um, and we had a pair nesting close to our, our research station. And I, I stalked this one for several days before I could get a nice photo. I finally got him out in the open and I was very chuffed, uh, chuffed to, to see this and, uh, and capture the species in this um, form. So moving on for the, from the route uh, from the main gate to the main camp, we, I'm going to go into the main camp itself. This is a view of uh, Mountain Zebra National Park's main camp from above. You can see the chalets there in the distance. And if I can digress from birds for a minute, just to talk about the camp itself. Um, and that is just to say that it has um, a variety of really great uh, accommodation options. You have a, a very well maintained campsite with very nice ablution facilities and, and other um, kitchen facilities. You then have the chalets, uh, if you feel like treating yourself to a bit more, more comfort or if that's your vibe, uh, as well as rock chalets, which are kind of the Lani version of the chalet. Um, option which is a little bit higher up um, within the camp uh, and all of these are extremely well kitted out and, and when I stayed there with my family actually back in 2019 um, I was super impressed by the yeah the decor the smart you know how well maintained it was I think um, shortly before we visited it all had a, a makeover and you can really um, see the difference that that's made. So I would say that it's a great option if you if you do want to stay in a chalet, but I have also camped there a couple of times and have very much enjoyed the campsite uh, at the main camp. There's also a swimming pool for those hot days um, and a restaurant which serves um, some really good um, food, uh, which you can have either at the restaurant or you can ask for a takeaway, which I did on my most recent visit so that I could go and sit somewhere with a nice view uh, and enjoy a burger and chips. So getting back to the birds and the birds of main camp, we have the pied starling. I think uh, most national park camps in Southern Africa seem to have overly familiar starlings uh, in residence. In the case of Mountain Zebra National Park, we have the pied starling. And it has quite striking markings compared to other starlings. You've got that very nice white vent, which is noticeable, the white eye ring, as well as the orange bill and, and sort of gape. Um, and these guys are very vocal in the main camp and, and very easily detected. One of those well-represented groups which you'll encounter frequently in the campgrounds, and indeed the wider park, uh, are the buntings. And all four of South Africa's resident buntings can be found here. That's the cinnamon-breasted bunting, the golden-breasted bunting, cape bunting, and lark-like bunting. There is, um, I know there's people at home saying, what about the cabanas's bunting? Um, that does also occur in the sub-region, but is more restricted to, or is restricted to Zimbabwe and Mozambique. So I think it's pretty cool that the four South African main camp of Mount Zebra National Park. So the three that I've, I've, I've got on this slide um, all have striped heads, uh, so easily identifiable as buntings. And in fact, that's why they have the Afrikaans names three copies, which I think once again is, is very uh, accurate to describe these guys. The golden, so in clockwise, the golden-breasted bunting is Roerich three copy, referring to its reddish, rusty red back. Um, the cape bunting, which is Klip three copy, 
um, sorry, that's the cinnamon breasted bunting, because the cape bunting is Royflak striopkopi, uh, referring to the red wing bar of that species. And I was particularly pleased to get the photo on the right um, within the main camp, uh, where you can really see that cinnamon breasted bunting singing his heart out on a very um, picturesque perch. The fourth member of this quartet is the lark like bunting. Uh, this is the most nondescript of the lot. It uh, doesn't have the striped head like the others, making ID, IDing the species a little bit of a challenge. And I think, you know, there aren't really any, any distinguishing features of the species. And it's actually sometimes confused with the female house sparrow, um, which is another very drab little bird. But um, the lark-like bunting has a slightly streaked crown, which is a good feature to look out for. And in the mountains of National Park, there's unlikely to be much overlap between the female house sparrow and the lark-like bunting. So if you see a bird that's largely unmarked um, in mountain zebra, then there's a good chance it's the lark-like bunting, um, which does also have a bit of an eyebrow to look out for. Another slightly little cryptic bird that uh, pops up uh, almost throughout Mountain Zebra National Park is the chestnut painted warbler, previously babbler. And this species is also very vocal, can also imitate, so you may be uh, bamboozled by hearing a bird that you think you know, and it turns out to be the chestnut painted warbler. There's also the Layard's warbler in the park, which doesn't have the chestnut vent. Unfortunately, the photo I have here could be either species, but in fact, was the chestnut vented warbler. I'm still hunting for that Layard's warbler. Um, but yeah, you will see quite a few of these, the chestnut vented variety. And they are, they are cool little birds to catch up with, I must say. This, uh, the species I encountered along the stream bed that runs through the main camp, and in fact, and this is a good place to find a lot of uh, little passerine species. You also get red-billed firefinch, uh, which is commonly encountered there and identified by, you guessed it, the red bill. Um, you do get African firefinch um, in the park as well, a little less common, but they have much more red on the body, a blue-black bill. And then those white spots, which the red bill also has, is just more prominent on the African firefinch. They really look like someone's taken tipex and has dotted the, the flanks of the bird with, with tipex. Um, in the same vein, along the, the, the stream bed through the park, you get uh, chin spot batis. Um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, with batises. Um, and not to be confused with the other member of, of this group in the park, which is the um, pirate batis, which is a more arid batis. Um, and these are easy to distinguish in the female variety. Uh, you can see that sort of orange wash on the breast of the, of the um, female on the left, uh, which is contrasting, if I just go back a slide, to the, that chest, strong chestnut um, band, breast band of the female chin spot batters. Whereas the males look incredibly similar um, and can be very difficult to separate. So it's good to try and find, find the female in this case. Uh, moving on to uh, another species might another species one might come across in the boundaries of the camp, and this is the red-fronted tinkerbird. So we had the acacia pied barbet earlier that I mentioned with that red um, forehead. This is the, the smaller uh, red-fronted tinkerbird. And it's quite cool because this bird in Mountain Zebra National Park is kind of on the edge of its range. Um, the species range generally covers the coastal belt on, on the eastern side of the country, starting around PE. So if you are coming through the interior from Joburg or Cape Town side, um, Mountain Zebra would be one of the first places you might encounter the red-fronted tinkerbird, um, which is pretty cool. Within the camp, you have two walking options, um, which is great for, for birders who like to get out on foot in the habitat. You have a one kilometer option and then 2.5 kilometer hike, which I think if memory serves is called the Mbila Trail. And this is a really nice walk to take. It's all within the fence of mountains uh, of the main camp, so you don't have to worry about the the big and scaries. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a great hike that starts in the camp and goes up um, the escarpment uh, along the side of the of this um, slope uh, and back down again. 
when I did this trail in 2019, my family and I encountered a, a troop of baboons, um, but they're not uh, as familiar as the, the Western Cape baboons and they kept their distance and we kept ours. So we were able to just pass them by. And I remember a real highlight for me being uh, encountering an African rock puppet, which is a real, uh, I would say a park special because you have such a good chance of seeing this um, slightly elusive uh, member of the puppet family. And I, we, um, my girlfriend at the time uh, actually saw this bird first and she kind of had a hunch that it was something I would really like to see. So she waited about 10 minutes on the trail for fear of flushing it until I got there. Uh, and um, then I was able to see the bird as well, which I'm forever grateful to her for because I managed to get this nice photo, um, which is almost something of a, of a habitat shot for the species. Uh, I was with my family that day and there's a picture of my old man uh, in situ in the habitat showing um, some of the, the boldest dune hillsides that you will come across. And then this is actually the photo that I posted earlier looking down at the camp is taken from this trail. Uh, you also have a chance of seeing Feroz eagle, which is uh, uh, an amazing species uh, to encounter anywhere. Um, and you have a good chance of seeing this mighty raptor um, from the main camp or while doing that trail. So if we go on to the, the loops that are available to you, we have um, the Northern Loop, which is either, you have the Ubajani Loop as well as the Sonnenrist 4x4 trail. And this, uh, this is the kind of habitat you can expect. It's these very grassy plains um, uh, with these slopes in the background. There's some kudu that you are quite likely to see during your stay. And this loop is great for ground birds. So we have the familiar secretary bird, as well as um, species such as Northern Black Coron, which you may encounter. And then one of the real stars of the show, which Andrew mentioned earlier, is the Blue Coron. And we have some cracking photos here of our mayor um, who encountered these species when he visited the park. Um, and this is just such a striking uh, ground nesting bird that you, you have a chance of coming across. Um, here's a nice uh, full frame photo that Mayer took of the species, unbelievable blue plumage uh, on the front of the bird. Ludwig's Bastard is another good one that you, you can look out for. Uh, this is a photo I managed to get a couple of years ago and it's uh, distinguishable from the uh, Denim's Bastard by that very charcoal, brown charcoal throat um, and dark head. Uh, and, and also having less white, uh, being an overall darker bird and having less white on the wing panel. This is a photo in flight taken by Lynette. You can see some white in the wing, but it is more restricted uh, than the denim's busted. And there you can see that, that sort of chocolate brown, charcoal brown throat. Um, and then there's a picture of yours truly scanning the, the planes uh, at the end of that Sonnen Roost uh, 4x4 trail. Then um, another 4x4 trail that's available to is the Yuri's Dam loop. I must just say that on my recent visit there, these trails are pretty rough at the moment. So um, it's worth visiting in a 4x4 if at all possible to give yourself access. Um, and you really do need a 4x4 to get uh, particularly along this Yuri's Dam trail. Uh, this is a photo I got of the namesake Cape Mountain Zebra um, with the beautiful Karoo background to boot. But uh, on your way up to these, this plateau, you have a good chance of encountering both sentinel and short-toed rock thrush on occasion. So two very cool um, species in the rock thrush group that you may come across. You can see the sentinel rock thrush has a more extended gray um, plumage uh, going down to sort of the mid chest, whereas the, the short toed rock thrush is just that gray is restricted to the neck and head. Uh, on this loop, you can also encounter some very cool um, smaller birds, such as the pink billed lark, a very special little lark that occurs in our, our sub region, as well as what's a favorite for a lot of people uh, being the African quail finch. And this photo was taken by Lynette at a, at a puddle of water, which is always a good um, thing to come across uh, on the Uri's Dam loop because birds are attracted to the water. Unfortunately, my most recent visit, the park is very dry 
was very dry and there were no puddles. So we didn't get to see the quail finch um, on that occasion. But when there is water, uh, this species as well as another good bird to find the black headed canary um, are often attracted to, to the water points. So they're good. Um, water is a good thing to keep an eye out for on the Uri's Dam Loop. Another species um, that I've encountered a couple of times in this area is common quail, um, often detected by their call. Um, or maybe just dashing through the grass or across the road um, on the Uri's Dam Loop. And then onto the, the Roy Plot Loop in the western section of the park. Now this is a really um, beautiful open grassland and um, gives you these fantastic vistas. Uh, this is a photo that I took in the, in the evening of two ostriches um, backlit by the sunset and really just is um, amazing to see or amazing how far you can see across the landscape in this part of the park. It is also an LBJ Mecca. Um, so we're gonna work through a few of those quickly. Um, we have a variety of locks. The most frequently encountered is probably the spot, the spike-yield lock. Um, a very orangey lock, a sort of orange cheek patch as well. Um, but a fairly long beak, so that's something to watch out for because this isn't part of the long billed um, cluster, which uh, the eastern long billed lark, which is on the right there, is. Eastern long billed lark's uh, call is quite diagnostic, a very long descending whistle to listen out for. In that group, you also occasionally encounter the Karoo long billed lark in this um, part of the park, but it is a much trickier bird to track down. Very similar to the Eastern long lark, but with a gray nape um, and a more streaky breast than the Eastern long lark uh, and a more well-marked back compared to the Eastern long lark's larks um, coloration. So rounding out the larks, we have also encounter the Eastern clapper lark quite often, a very boldly marked lark with a shorter stubbier bill as well as a large billed lark, which has a yellow lower mandible to look out for. Um, so those are another two frequently encountered larks uh, inside mountain zebra. Um, so now we're going on to two uh, true LBJ uh, headache inducing groups. Um, I don't think we have too much time to really go into the details, but these are five of the chats uh, well, four of the chats and a chat flycatcher that you can encounter in the park. Fairly similar looking birds. Well, the anteating chat and the crew chat are fairly strongly uh, marked compared to the other three, but familiar and sickowing chat as well as chat flycatcher are quite similar. So it's worth getting hold of, of your a good bird guide, perhaps uh, Francie's LBJ book um, to separate these species. It can be done, it just needs a bit of work. In a very similar vein, we have the, the pipits, um, and we have, I've got four species of pipits here. I mentioned the African rock pipit earlier, but these are four very similar pipits that you may encounter. Uh, we have buffy pipit, which is that sort of warmer brown, plain colored pipit, with a strong eyebrow, but otherwise not very strongly marked on the face. And uh, Nicholson's pipit, which is more of an intermediate um, looking pipit, uh, often perches in trees. Although if you look at the African pippet, which I have bottom left, I did find this one perching in a tree rather misleadingly. Um, and then finally a plain back pippet, which is also a rather um, plain coloration, but is a duller brown compared to the warmer brown of the buffy pippet. Um, there are other separating uh, factors, but I'm gonna set you some homework if you are intending to visit the park, and that is to, to try and go through the differences between these different species. Let's move on to something a little more boldly marked, and that is the double banded courser. Another great photo from Maya showing these two species, and, and Andrew and a couple of people in the chat also mentioned the double banded courses. And I mean, they just are such striking looking birds with those, that beautiful, um, sort of symmetrical uh, pair of black collars um, over the breast. And there's a really good chance of seeing the species on the Roy Plot loop. Um, so keep an eye out because they are incredibly well camouflaged. So you are kind of just keeping an eye out for, for to detect some movement. Um, but I was very fortunate on my most recent visit, which was actually this last Sunday, to connect with these these species or this species. 
Finally, I thought I'd include a picture of the common ostrich because it's a really nice picture of a common ostrich chick, um, which may have captured on the Roy plot, um, which you have a good chance of. Well, you, you will see ostriches pretty much throughout the park, but they are particularly striking when seen with a backdrop of these sweeping grasslands. The last section of the park that I'll be covering is the Kranzkop Loop. And this is the long uh, southern loop within the park which I've circled there, but you might be able to see I've circled as well a small, uh, I've put in a small red circle there because that section, which is the beginning of the Kranzkop loop and very close to camp is actually where you can get a lot of the Kranzkop loop specials. So if you don't feel like doing the whole southern loop, it's good to focus on that area. Um, and I did mention the African rock puppet earlier, but there's a good chance of seeing this. I've also uh, connected with um, pale wing starling uh, on the Kranzkop loop, which is a cool, um, less common uh, cousin of the red wing starling. Uh, you've got to look at things like eye color as well as how, uh, the, how, how pale those um, wing bars are in flight. Um, and then we also have the mountain wheat ear, which is encountered uh, on this route. Um, and you get a couple of different morphs of this species, you get a, a much grayer morph, which is uh, worth keeping an eye out for, but a very striking black and white bird when, when seen in this form, um, which I have been fortunate to see on the Kranzkop loop, as well as actually in the main camp. I didn't mention it earlier, but there is a couple that can be um, picked up um, within the main camp itself. Uh, lastly, this is the Buff Street Chat, um, which you can also find in this part of the park, enjoying the sort of boulder strewn hillsides. And yeah, you can see why it's got the name. It's got that buff, buff color to the underparts and uh, kind of like the mountain wheat here also got striking black um, coloration on the head and the wings in the back. And I was speaking to Lynette Radman earlier. Uh, she mentioned that uh, ground woodpecker can also be found um, on this route, which I haven't included the picture of here because I actually haven't seen the ground woodpecker in the park, but that is a very cool bird to keep an eye out for as well. Um, and, you know, if it's your first visit to the park, I know I said it's a, a, rather, it's a fairly lengthy loop. Um, it's really worth doing just for the views. The views on the Kranzkop loop are unbelievable. So even if you don't see um, as many birds as you maybe see on the other routes, it's well worth the trip. Um, drive slowly, take your time and just enjoy these uh, sweeping Karoo landscapes because you, you really meander up the, up the escarpment and get uh, right on top of the plateau and you have amazing views for forever. <laughs> um, and just as an aside, in the next slide, I've got a, a picture of a red-billed oxpecker um, feeding off a Cape Buffalo and most, the majority of my Cape Buffalo sightings have also been in the sort of valley section at the start of the Kranzkop loop. So that pretty much wraps up um, my coverage of the different loops that you can do within the park. I know I haven't covered everything, um, so feel free to drop comments in, in the chat um, about areas that I might not have covered uh, that you have experienced um, and had good sightings along. Um, but I would like to also just mention that if you do stay in the camp, you have the option of doing guided drives and guided walks as well, obviously at an extra charge. But one of the things I can recommend is the night drive because you have a good chance of, well, when we did it on a you know, visit earlier this year, uh, we had fantastic views of both spotted eagle owl and barn owl, uh, western barn owl. So those were, were great. But as Andrew mentioned earlier, you have a strong chance of seeing these little guys, uh, the aardvolf, um, which are quite um, numerous throughout the park and, and often, often seen on these night drives. So well worth doing that if you, if you can spare the, the cash and you feel up to it. So if I just end off with some pros and cons, um, one of the big pros of this park is it's, it's still a little bit undiscovered, so to speak. So it's a bit of a hidden gem, although many people will say it's one of their favorite parks. There are lots of people that haven't yet visited it, which makes for a, a relatively quiet experience to some of, uh, compared to some of South Africa's other national parks. And so it's really ideal for a birding experience because there's very little traffic and you can just putter along nice and slowly and stop for every little LBJ uh, that you see.
There's also a good range of habitats like we discussed today, tonight. There's some amazing scenery. I, I can't say enough, actually. Uh, I haven't done it justice in, in the few photos of the landscapes that I've included in this presentation, but um, yeah, just really is a stunning park from a geographical um, and landscape point of view. Like you've seen tonight, there are some fantastic birds to catch up with. Uh, again, I will give the disclaimer that I haven't included nearly all of them, and some of your favorites might have been left out for that. Uh, if that is the case, I apologize. Um, there's uh, cuckoos and swallows and sunbirds that I haven't touched on, um, but uh, I think I could probably talk about the birds all night that you can see in Mountain Zebra, so I had to limit myself. And the last thing I've said there is, is revisitability. I think I might have invented that word, um, but I'm just, what I'm trying to get at is that you can go back to Mountain Zebra National Park several times and enjoy yourself every time um, because you can try different loops, you can focus on different areas and you're going to have different sightings as well. In the cons list, there aren't really cons actually. Um, I've got there that LBJs are hard work. But I think any birder worth their salt is going to be prepared to put in the time to um, distinguish between the different LBJs and Mountain Zebra National Park. If you want to tick off some LBJs, this is the, this is the land of the LBJs. So uh, worth a visit for those alone. And then I've listed seasonal variation there just because um, it is experiencing a drought at the moment uh, and winter is um, the drier time of the year. And when I visited very recently, I was struck by just how dry the park was, which means your bird diversity is going to be a little bit lower. So if you are considering visiting this year and you haven't yet booked, I would say it's worth keeping an eye on the weather reports to see when they have the first of their spring rains, which fingers crossed uh, will be coming soon. Um, because once those rains do come, the, the landscape does transform and there'll be a green flush to everything and there'll be water in the streams and um, in the puddles and the pans. And that does really improve your chance, chances of seeing um, a wider variety of bird life. Lastly, I would just like to um, mention this birding weekend that is organized by the honorary rangers, I saw in the chat, sorry, I'm not sure who it was, but there was an honorary ranger in the chat mentioning um, that there is um, a drive to encourage people to bird in the park. And I was actually call it, um, contacted by an honorary ranger, Willem Olifir, uh, earlier, um, just to sort of promote this event a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a birding weekend that's been running since 2012. Um, and they recorded 279 species in the park over the years. Um, so, you know, if you are at all uh, flexible, I would consider booking for this weekend. It's very reasonably priced. Uh, it's the 5th to the 7th of November, so almost exactly a month from now. And it's, uh, it's going to be guided by some very experienced uh, rangers uh, who know the area really well. And... This is all part of an ongoing process to keep updating the parks list. Um, this is what, what Willem was telling me earlier. So if you want to contribute uh, and play a part to increasing the, the bird list of Mountain Zebra National Park, it's very well worth joining this birding weekend or the private um, Mountain Zebra National Park challenge. And you can get hold of one of the, the honorary rangers to join this on Bird Lasser. And then uh, you can keep your own tally of birds seen in the park and contribute to um, the expanding knowledge of AV fauna in the area. I'd like to just thank uh, the photographers that have contributed to uh, this presentation. I couldn't have done it without them, uh, notably Lynette Radman, Maya Prach, uh, Craig Widows, um, Michael Duplessis, and um, yeah, I'm just very grateful that I was able to, to use their, their photos this evening. Thanks very much, and I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation and that you'll consider visiting Mountains of National Park in the near future. Thanks so much, Wesley. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I encourage you, when we're done with this, to go and read the chat box because people are just uh, so keen to get off to Mountains Everywhere, whether it's for the first time or to go again. I definitely include myself in that group. I think you, your invented word, revisibility, re, re, what was it? Revisitability. <laughs> Revisitability. Your Wesleyism um, is, is definitely true. I'm, I'm so keen to go back. Uh, I went and checked the SABAP website while you were talking to see what my personal tally is for the park because uh, I saw that 129 is a, a challenge. But um, 
over my two Atlas cards, I've only got 109 species. So <laughs> to get 129 on one card is pretty phenomenal. So, but the challenge is out there. And uh, as you said, there's always, there's always something new to see. There's always something unexpected. I remember running into black cuckoo sharks at Mountain Zebra and they're, they're very scarce in that area. But Mountain Zebra throws up these gems all the time. So I really do encourage people to go go visits, go enjoy this, uh, as, as Wesley said, this unappreciated or, or hidden, hidden gem uh, in the Eastern Capes network of, of South African national parks. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to just share my final uh, presentation for you all here. So next week, as you will see, we have um, Doug Newman. Doug's going to be talking on the mechanics of birdsong. I'm quite excited about this one. I've, I've always wondered how birds manage to make the incredible array of uh, vocalizations that they do, um, not just among species, but even within a species, how some of them are able to create these incredible sounds. So I'm really looking forward to Doug's talk, and I encourage you to join me next week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., as always, with Conservation Conversations. So there are a few questions in the chat box already, which I'll get to now. Um, if you are watching on Facebook Live, you can also post your uh, questions in the chat and your comments for Wesley as well. Um, so we will kick those off. I'm going to just start with a question regarding access to the park. Um, Tanya Kiesberger wants to know, Wesley, whether or not you need a 4x4. Uh, you, you mentioned some of the 4x4 routes, but for general access to the rest of the park, what are your thoughts on 4x4s? Yeah, so um, the roads are, are generally quite good where they aren't marked uh, four by four only. So, you know, if you're on a sedan or something, it's not going to, I wouldn't say you should worry about visiting, whether you should visit the park or not. Um, you will have really good access to a lot of the routes and areas. I will just say that the Sonnenrist four by four trail and the Yuri's Dam four by four trail are particularly um challenging at the moment. I think what happened was early in the year they had quite a lot of heavy rain and have since had a long dry spell and, and this combination of factors has meant that it's, it's quite a rough uh, drive. Not for the entirety of those loops but just getting up onto those plateaus. Um, they've got very steep access roads so um, yeah you would be encouraged to, to have a 4x4 if you want to do those two routes but like I said you can have a fantastic experience in the park um, without a 4x4 as well. Great, good stuff. Um, a couple other questions here. Sitimbiso Majoka, who was all the way through your presentation as, as things came up that you wanted to see, was saying, ah, bucket list species, bucket list species. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's overdue a visit to Mountain Zebra. Sitimbiso, you've got to get yourself to the, to the Karoo. He wants to know what, what time of year do you think is the best time to visit? Um, and also his second part to his question is, any comments on migrants in the park? Yeah, so it, it's a little tricky to say in terms of the best time of the year to visit. I, I will say I think my most memorable trip was um, my first one, which was in, in March of 2019. Um, and that was when there was a real green uh, flush to the whole reserve because it was at the end of summer. Um, so I would say it's worth just finding out what the rain has been like because that does play a big role. Um, and I would say probably late summer is a good time. Um, but you can pretty much go any time of the year and enjoy it. Um, I haven't been in the middle of the heat of December or January, so I would be curious to know what it's like then. But you know, once again, I'm sure um, because of the rainfall during that time of the year, it's going to be it's going to be a good trip. Um, as for the migrants question, yeah, I unfortunately didn't uh, get to touch on on that very much. Um, I'm normally, I normally have my eyes glued to the, the grass and the um, um, open uh, flatlands in looking for LBJs. So I don't focus so much on the migrants. However, um, a couple of people have said that Mountain Zebra National Park is great for um, great spotted cuckoo, uh, especially in the valley bottom. So that's a really cool migrant to look out for. Uh, and then you will get your, your, your typical uh, swallows and swifts of the region. The only swallow I saw in my most recent visit was pearl-breasted swallow. Um, so that is a cool one to look out for. But uh, yeah, I, I think um, I'm perhaps not the most qualified person to speak on, on the migrants having um, not really spent a lot of time on them uh, myself. 
Fair enough. And uh, thanks for those tips on seasonality. As you say, I think a visit any time of year is going to be a good visit. And it's also, you know, with your revisitability, I'm going to bring up that word again, you know, coming back in the different seasons really does show you different sides to the park. As you said, after the first rains, the pace really transforms. Um, so being able to see it in the different seasons is also quite a pleasure and uh, an interesting experience on its own. Um, Eileen Morrison would like to know, uh, with your, your slide on, on separating Gabar Goswalk and Pale Chanting Goswalk, and mm -hmm. then looking at the melanistic form, she wondered, is there any difference in bill coloration as an extra feature that you could look out for, uh, particularly between melanistic Gabar and the Pale Chanting Goswalk? Um, it's a good question. Uh, if I understand, so obviously the melanistic gabar is its, is its sort of its own uh, unique um, bird to look at, but in terms of bill color between gabar goshawk and pale chanting goshawk, they are very similar. Um, so, I mean, Andrew, you feel free to weigh in here, but I've never really looked at the bill or leg color um, to separate those two because they are both that sort of orangey pinkish uh, color um, perhaps a little more orange in the pale chanting goshawk versus that um, deeper pinky orange in the gabal goshawk but yeah um, good to look at the other features to separate those two species yeah i, I did notice um interestingly you showed two photos of the melanistic gabal the one was in golden uh, golden gates i'm still on last month's webinar um, <laughs> mountain zebra national park and um and the other one was in Zimbabwe, of that one near the research station where you were in Zimbabwe. Um, and the melanistic gabar in Mountain Zebra had a fully black sear, or like a charcoal colored sear, whereas mm -hmm. your bird in Zimbabwe still had that pinkish orange sear. So I, I think that must be a bit of a variable characteristic. So bull coloration is a little bit tricky with the melanistic form, um, just based on that. I think the one of the one of the big differences on the bill is more the size of the bill. Gabar is a much smaller bird overall and has a much smaller bill. The sear is much uh, less broad and, and less robust than the pale chanting goshawk, which has a lot of orangey pink on the bill on the sear, in particular with the black tip. Whereas the black tip and the sear and the gabar goshawk, the smaller bird, are almost the same size um, and it's a smaller bill overall. So thanks for that question, I mean, that was an interesting. Um, an interesting one. Uh, Letitia Steinberg would like to know, are there any sand fox guides at Mountain Zebra that specialize in the birds or should one arrange for an external bird guide? Do you, do you know kind of any guides in the area? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the guy that I went with on the night drive was pretty good with his birds. Um, yeah, I would say the, there's only a couple of guides that work there um, at any given time and they are very likely to have a good idea of the bird life there considering that a lot of people come to visit the park so I don't want to sell them short um, unfortunately I've just never actually been out with those guys um, in the day and, and seen you know how, how hot they are with their bird identification but I would I would go out on a limb and say that if you do um, go with uh, one of the sand parks guides that they will be pretty clued up on their birds considering mountain zebra's reputation as a birding destination. Great, thanks very much. Eleanor Mary has a question and I, I'm kind of reading between the lines but it sounds like she's planning a bit of a trip. So <laughs> she, she wants to know how close Mountain Zebra National Park is to Addo National Park and I guess the, the subtext there is can you group a trip to visit both <laughs> can you do both yeah absolutely i would say that'd be a really nice uh, combination especially if you're coming from further afield like cape town or um johannesburg they are so i said earlier that pe was three hours from mountain zebra uh, i think um you could do a bit better than that if you're coming from addo out of the north gate um, and I would say you're probably looking at uh, two to two and a half hours between the two parks, which is really not so bad. So um, in my opinion, it's definitely worth doing um, both of those, uh, especially if you, you know, you want to see uh, the big, the elephants and big herds of them, which you're obviously not going to see in Mountain Zebra, where there are no elephants. Um, 
However, uh, the birding and mountain zebra is, in my humble opinion, far superior to Addo. Um, both parks have their pros and cons, and it's uh, or strengths and weaknesses, should I say. So it's worth um, visiting both in a trip like that, definitely. Fantastic. So that's all the questions I have. I'm just going to quickly look at the Facebook feed and check that there isn't a, a couple of questions there. There's certainly a few people, even on the Eastern Cape uh, Facebook group, saying thank you so much for the presentation. Um, they're going to plan a trip there now. So, so not just people from outside the Eastern Cape, but you're even, um, you're even convincing some people from within the province to go and visit <laughs> their own little city den. So wonderful. <laughs> there, there was one last question, which I'll, I'll just entertain. I want to know if you're any uh, any relative of Peter Gush. Peter Gush, uh, they are. Uh, we're not a we're not a huge lineage, but th despite that, there are some Gushes that I, I'm not familiar with. So um, I'm not unfortunately in touch with a Peter Gush. Uh, okay. But yeah, sorry, Andrew. If if I can just comment on, on one of the earlier questions, uh, which I don't feel like I uh, answered adequately, which was about the migrants. Um, I just would, would say that the park is great all year round. So you're not really going to a, a habitat or a landscape where you're going to have a huge increase in the, in the diversity of the birds um, because of migrants. In fact, a lot of the target species that people go for are present year round. So there are some cool migrants that come in, like I mentioned, uh, in the, in, amongst the cuckoos um, and swallows, etc. cetera. Uh, however, you know, migratory birds are not what make the park special if, if I can say it like that so you, you know if you if you think about what time of the year to go I would say that the, the, the cool birds or the, the, the target birds that a lot of people go for are present pretty much year round. Fantastic thanks so much Wesley and we're going to wrap it up there uh, thank you for sharing your very extensive knowledge of the park and uh, all the different birds people really appreciated your in-depth uh, ID tips, especially. Um, I see Yvonne Pennington put in the chat box. That this is this seems like a prime destination for swatting up on your LBJs. So uh, you, um, you have to, you absolutely have to. <laughs> yeah, so you have to. In fact, that, and I, I love what you said about lock like bunting um, not really having any features. It was it was literally <laughs> it was literally said to me by a very senior bird who I won't um, name and shame that uh, if you're looking at a bird and you just absolutely cannot pick up on any features to mention it's undoubtedly a lark like bunting so <laughs> the lack of features is a feature in itself so that that's how yep. tricky lbjs get and so <laughs> i hope everyone takes up the challenge and uh, goes and visits mountain zebra national park as always you can go back and watch these webinars on our youtube channel just search for like south africa on youtube and you'll pick them all up there all 75 episodes and counting so lastly just Thanks, Wesley, for your time. Thank you for sharing all the photographs and, and the, the tips and tricks with us. And uh, I hope you stay safe and get some good rains um, soon in the Eastern Cape. Cool. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. It's been a, it's been a real uh, privilege talking to everyone this evening. Thanks.